So hello, everybody. Um, I can see that we currently have already over 100 people uh, viewing at the moment with more joining us all the time. So as it's 12.30, I think we'll make a start because I know Josh is excited to get through all of his material with you. And um, there's quite a bit to cover within Salt Marshes, of course. Um, before we do, if I've not met anyone before, I'm Rachel Murphy. So I'm the volunteer manager for the National Plant Monitoring Scheme. Uh, and today's webinar on spectacular salt marshes uh, is part of our ongoing series of free training sessions for our MPMS volunteer surveyors. But of course, also welcome to anybody new to the scheme or considering joining our lovely volunteer community. Perhaps um, this is news to you about the MPMS. Um, and hopefully we may be able to uh, inspire some more folk to get involved. Um, we're a nationwide citizen science project uh, with hundreds of volunteers heading out twice a year to carry out plant surveys on their plots um, and really to help us monitor the health of our habitats. So as I say, I hope today's session will inspire you to join up and take part if you're not already. Uh, no pressure, Josh, put on you there. <laughs> Um, you can find out more about the scheme, um, how to get involved, and um, perhaps read our past uh, reports and research um, on our website, which I have already popped a link to in the chat. Uh, without further ado, uh, I shall introduce and say a big welcome and thank you to Botanical Specialist Joshua Stiles, who will be introducing us to one of Britain's most imperiled coastal habitats, our salt marshes which actually is also currently one of the least surveyed habitat types. So thank you, Josh. Brilliant. Hello. Um, right, I'll just share my screen. Can you hear perfect. that? Yep, see that and hear you perfect. Match it. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, brilliant. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for having me, Rachel. Um, and for those of you who don't know me yet, yeah, hello, my name is Josh Stiles. I'm a botanist. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking to you about a really special habitat in fact it's one of two uh, habitats in Britain which we could describe as being near natural um, which means that salt marshes are old salt marshes which are formed naturally we could say that they're near natural which means that they're a habitat one of two habitat types in Britain which probably don't look too dissimilar to how they might have looked a uh, long, long time ago before humans came in uh, and messed everything up. Um, really, really special habitat, um, which, yeah, excited to chat to you all about today. Brilliant. So, um, for the first slide, I'm just going to go over a few little learning objectives um, of what I'd like everyone to take away from this very short little webinar today. I'll try not to waffle so I can cram everything in. Uh, brilliant. So as a first learning objective, I would like everyone at the end of today's little um, webinar to understand what a salt marsh is and how they form, which is what we will be going over first, as well as and a few other bits and pieces. Um, secondly, I'd like people to feel able, uh, especially those of you who are MPMS volunteers, to identify salt marsh alongside some of the characteristic species that grow in them, which we'll be talking about throughout this presentation. And finally, uh, the bulk of this presentation is going to be focusing, it's going to be homing in on, I think, 20 MPMS target species um, and those target species are species that really are um, often characteristic of salt marshes um, uh, and we're going to be learning some of the, the diagnostic features of those species uh, so that we know how to identify them in the field. Brilliant! Super duper. So to get cracking, some of you at this point might be wondering what on earth is a salt marsh? Well, as the name suggests, it's a saline wetland. Um, typically, um, 99 times out of 100, it is a saline wetland developed in and around estuaries around the coast. Um, the only exception really to that is we do actually have inland salt marshes, especially around Cheshire and Staffordshire, where there are 
things like brine springs and you'll you'll get inland salt marshes but most of our salt marshes are developed in and around estuaries they are host uh their, their saline wetlands, the, the environmental conditions at play are incredibly hostile to plants. And so because the environment itself is hostile to survive there as a plant species, you need to be a specialist. You need to be specially adapted to cope um, with those hostile conditions um, provided by, by that saline inundation. Um, because salt marshes are, are host to such a specialist, a diversity of specialist wildlife, um, what you'll often find is that the vast majority of salt marshes, thankfully, are covered by special statutory designations. So they could be within, I don't know, a Ramsar, a Triple SI, an SAC, combination of all of those things. Um, so that's a bit of good news, uh, that as such a specialist habitat, we've got most of our salt marsh can be covered by those special designations, which grant them special protection. Which is great, isn't it? Brilliant. Um, of course, salt marshes, um, they are incredibly important. They are host to a range of specialist plants. Uh, it's not just specialist plants, though. There are lots of animals, especially invertebrates and fungi, like this beautiful um, Spartina or cord grass ergot fungus, uh, which only grows on cord grass and it replaces the female genitalia with these fruit bodies, um, which is yeah, quite groovy. Um, so yeah, salt marsh is host to not just specialist plants, but specialist animals and fungi and all, all sorts of other stuff as well that you will not find in any other habitat. Really remarkable habitat are salt marshes. But salt marshes aren't just important for biodiversity, although they're really important for biodiversity. They have loads of other things um, that we should value them for. They're an incredible asset when it comes to flood protection. Um, a lot of homes and infrastructure rely on the presence of salt marshes to give that bit of flood protection. Um, but as well as that, um, they are incredibly important when it comes to their ability to sequester carbon, which is great. Um, in fact, in a recent 2021 study by MMU, the Manchester Metropolitan Uni University, they found significant um, carbon sequestration across their salt marsh study sites. They found that salt marshes, um, or at least their salt marsh study sites, were able to sequester um, 19 tonnes of carbon uh, per hectare per year, which is a hell of a lot, translates to about 71 tonnes of carbon dioxide being pulled out of the atmosphere and being sequestered every single year per hectare. And so salt marshes, when it comes to global biodiversity loss, when it comes to global climate change, they are an incredibly important um, piece of the puzzle when it comes to finding some kind of a solution to both of those major crises that are going on at the moment. Really, really important habitats. And so how do salt marshes form? We know what they are, we know they're important, but how do they get there in the first place? Well, there is a salt marsh succession going on when these habitats develop around estuaries, which they do most of the time. Um, what happens is when your estuaries pump out sediment or estuarine mud, you'll begin to get things, uh, pioneers that are able to grow on them. And that especially includes things like cord grass, and other plants, uh, glassworts, which are really groovy little plants. I always describe them as like little alien Christmas trees. Uh, I've got a picture of one just on the left here. And so as your estuaries pump out your, your estuarine mud, your sediment, 
um, which accumulates and forms mud flats, um, you'll begin to get these pioneers that grow on them. Um, but it doesn't just stop there. As vegetation um, colonizes your estuarine mud, what you'll find is like a mesh, um, your vegetation begins to trap sediment. And the level of your salt marsh begins to raise up as vegetation continues to capture um, your estuarine sediments. Uh, all that lovely mud. Um, and as levels begin to increase, um, a raft of different species are able to colonize because as levels increase, the sea inundates that area less and less. Um, and so as levels increase, you don't have your pioneers perhaps anymore. You'll get a different range of species in your salt marsh, especially things like your sea lavenders and beautiful little plants like the sea purslane. Um, but it doesn't just stop there. As this dense mesh of vegetation um, develops, it doesn't just stop catching um, all of that lovely mud. And it keeps doing it and levels continue to rise on your salt marsh and eventually you'll end up with an upper salt marsh where you have things like common reed and sea club brush, which goes uh, to dry land to, to, to support things that perhaps um, aren't tolerant to, to saline inundation, things like trees and loads and loads of other plants. Um, and so broadly speaking, that is your salt marsh succession. You start out with mud, estuarine mud, which gets colonized by your pioneer species. As levels begin to rise in your salt marsh, the vegetation, the community of plants that are able to occupy that space changes. Um, and it changes as the level of the salt marsh increases. I'm going to keep an eye on time because I have a tendency to waffle. Okay, brilliant. And so we know what a salt marsh is, we know they're special, um, and we know that they're, they're really important. Um, we've talked about plants being specialists, and that's how these habitats are ultimately able to exist in the first place, because of those specialist plants that live there. But what makes them specialist? Um, what adaptations do they have that allows them to persist in such an amazing hostile, amazingly hostile environment? Well, what you'll often find with these salt marsh plants is they have a range of different adaptations that allow them to survive uh, in these habitats. Uh, plants could employ things like selective filtration. So um, their roots, could effectively exclude salt from being absorbed from entering their tissues. A lot of plants will take in salt, um, but they'll have specialized glands um, across their leaves that can allow um, the excretion of salt, like a lot of auric species have. Uh, some plants will perhaps concentrate loads of salt into a couple of leaves or a bit of, bit of their tissue that they'll, that they'll lose. Um, and a lot of plants can become succulent. Um, so a lot of plants reduce water loss by transpiring less and retaining more water in their tissues. Um, and plants can perhaps um, employ a mishmash of all of those things. So, um, to exist in these habitats, these specialist plants uh, can have a real range of adaptations that can allow them to deal with all this horrible salt uh, that they don't want to have uh, being absorbed into their tissues. Brilliant. Cool. Salt marshes are great. We know what they are. Uh, we know they're important. We know that to survive there, Plants, animals, fungi, generally, you need to be a specialist. However, the bad news is, as special and amazing as salt marshes are, we are losing 
a hell of a lot of it, sadly, uh, mainly down to sea level rise. Um, but in Britain, we're losing around 100 hectares salt marsh every single year. Isn't that sad? Um, I think so. Um, however, when it comes to their conservation, um, the good news is, as a society, um, at, although our environment's changing, I think as a society, our attitude has changed um, to these sorts of habitats where even botanists would have described salt marsh or sand dune or what we now know to be incredibly valuable habitats as wasteland. Um, people see these places as really special now. And what um, what's happened quite a lot in, in sort of recent times is where at one point we were converting habitats to productive agricultural land and other different kinds of land. Um, now we're reverting some of that damage. And so across a lot of Britain, um, there are a lot of salt marsh reclamation projects going on. And this is one example in the bottom right corner in Southport, Hesketh Outmarsh. And what the RSPB alongside people like the Environment Agency did here was um, where there was um, some sort of low intensity agricultural land that would have once been salt marsh, but it was isolated from the sea by a big old sea, um, sea wall. Um, what the RSPB, the EA, and a few other people did was they allowed seawater to enter into those fields again, over about 300 odd hectares. A massive site. What's happened is quite quickly over the past decade or so, we've had salt marsh redevelop. Um, and there are lots of little schemes like that, little um, reclamation projects like that happening across Britain. Uh, long may it continue. Um, brilliant, brilliant. So I've waffled on relatively quickly. <laughs> um, through an introduction to salt marsh, what they are, how they form, uh, some of the adaptations they have, their importance. And we've briefly talked upon uh, sort of conservation. Um, now, what I would like to focus on um, is looking at some of those species which grow in our salt marshes um, and how to identify them, which is the main focus of today's little presentation. And so what I'm going to do over the remaining time um, is look over 20 different species, some of their characteristic features, um, and hopefully by the end of it, you'll all feel confident to go out onto a salt marsh and know what absolutely everything is. Um, brilliant, right, let's go through. So um, our first species is a beautiful little plant. It's uh, in the Apiaceae, the carrot family. It's a wonderful family. Uh, it's really peculiar as well. About half the species within the APACA are beautiful, tasty, edible plants, and then the other half will kill you. Um, this is one that might not kill you. Um, it's wild celery, Apium graviolens. It's the same species as the stuff you find in a shop, um, stuff that you chop up and put into stews and whatever. Um, and for those of you who are MPMS volunteers, this is also an MPMS wildflower species, which I indicate with this little wildflower icon. Um, so yeah, wild celery on salt marsh is quite a distinctive plant. It's a tall, upright biennial plant. So it completes its life cycle in two years. And you'll often find it in sort of mid to upper salt marsh, especially by ditches and on river margins. And in terms of the characteristic features for this species, what I've tried to do on all these slides is instead of waffling on a big essay, 
um, giving you a big essay of features. I've tried to highlight, try to embolden those features that might be most easily remembered uh, or most distinctive. And for wild celery, perhaps the most distinctive feature is its smell. Um, it really smells strongly of celery when you crush it. Um, but aside from its smell, um, wild celery, it has grooved um, stems. And when you look at its pinnate or divided leaves, what you will see on a leaf is the basal leaflets. So these bits that I've circled here are stalked. So it has stalked basal leaflets if the strong smell of celery um, wasn't enough for you. Um, and this is a plant that is going to be hopefully in flower around now. Um, and yeah, quite a distinctive plant. You don't really get very many umbellifers, members of this family on salt marshes. Um, so yeah, wild celery, quite a distinctive, distinctive species. On to our second species, which is again, another really beautiful um, little plant. Uh, it's one of my favorites. Uh, it's Thrift, Armeria maritima. And thrift isn't a tall, upright thing. It's quite a short, a small cushion or mat forming perennial plant. Uh, so it persists year after year, it comes back year after year. Um, which you will often find in salt marshes as well as on cliff tops. Um, and this is a plant which doesn't have pinnate or divided leaves, it has linear leaves. So leaves that are, yeah, they're straight and parallel sided. And these linear leaves are produced in little rosettes that look a little bit like this drawing. Um, which are arranged together in cushions. And although it has a long flowering season, plants tend to flower between, mostly between sort of June, July. And when it's in flower, it is really, really distinctive. Um, so it has these small globular um, clusters of pink flowers, which have um, five, pink petals, which if you pull a flower from the flowering head, these globular flowering heads, all of those petals, those five petals are fused together into something called a corolla or a petal tube, um, which I've tried to draw here. Excellent. So we've got our thrift with our cushions of um, basal rosettes with these linear leaves and in the summer they have these globular pink flowering heads which you should still be able to find around about now. Magical. Okay on to our next species which is for those of you who are MPMS volunteers another wildflower species. Um, and this is Siasta, um, Tripolium Panonicum. Um, it's a really beautiful plant that flowers in sort of late summer, should have started flowering around now. Um, really important late pollen and nectar resource that lots of pollinators love, including a globally rare bee uh, called a sea aster mining bee, uh, Calites halophilus, which feeds on virtually nothing else but this. And yeah, sea aster, really beautiful, really valuable plant. Um, it is a tall, another biennial, so it completes its life cycle, usually completes uh, its life cycle in sort of two years. And it can sometimes be an annual plant, so completes it in a single year. Um, it's hairless, so it's glabrous, um, and it is a succulent species which has these succulent sort of shiny glabrous leaves which are lanceolate so they're lance shaped uh, and they taper at their base uh, which i've 
You can kind of see in the picture, but I've also drawn a little picky on as well. Um, flowers produced in late summer, round about now. And generally, nine times out of 10, they have, I don't want to call them petals, but they have these blue to lilac petals. The correct term isn't petal actually at all. Um, they're ligules. And each one of these petal-like things on the outside of the flowering head is actually an individual flower. Um, so yeah, call them petals if you want, but the correct term is, is ligules. And they'll usually have these blue to, to lilac ligules, although occasionally you do find plants that don't have them at all. Yeah, sea aster. Um, really, really beautiful, really valuable plant of salt marshes. Uh, sea purslane. Uh, this one doesn't have the little wildflower logo by the name. So for those of you who are MPMS volunteers again, um, this is not an MPMS wildflower species. Um, sea purslane, another beautiful specialist. Um, this is quite a short sort of woody perennial plant. Um, with glaucous leaves. So if you look at the leaves in the picture, they're like a gray, bluey green. So they're glaucous. Um, as we covered a little bit earlier in the presentation when we were talking about plant adaptations, um, this is an auric, this is an atriplex species. And as you can hopefully see from this picture, especially this leaf down here, the leaves are quite mealy looking. Um, and that's actually caused by those specialised glands which excrete salt. Um, if you taste an atriplex leaf, they will be very, very salty. Um, magic. And when it comes to the flowers, they're these beautiful, weird, uh, clusters of yellowy brown flowers and later in the year when the seeds are produced um, you'll see close up that the seeds are actually encapsulated in two triangular flaps of tissue and those triangular flaps are called bracteoles and quite a lot of people struggle to differentiate atriplex species or uh, oryx from related plants, things like goosefoots. Um, and actually, this is when they're in fruit, this is one way to really confidently tell the difference because all atriplex species, all of your oryx, have these bracteoles which are triangular, whereas the fruiting structures in related species are not ever triangular and um, they're generally circular. So yeah, that's one way to, to tell the difference. And this is quite a late flowering, late flowering plant. Beautiful species. Um, magic. On to our next one, which is a really common coastal plant. It's beet, or some people might know it as sea beet. Uh, and this is a sprawling, much branched perennial plant with, uh, it doesn't have mealy leaves like our sea purslane, they're shiny and sort of fleshy and glabrous, so hairless. Um, the leaves themselves are ovate um, with a cuneate base. So just like our sea aster, they taper down the leaf stalk at the base, they're cuneate. Um, the flowers are produced in dense clusters on flowering spikes. And although it's a relative sea purslane, as we've said about the fruiting structures, they're different for our oryx or atriplex species than for related species. The fruits, the structures that contain the seeds in beet are circular um, and they don't have those two flaps of tissue. 
um, our bracteoles, they have um, five little flaps or five little tepals, um, which are persistent and basically encapsulate, they clasp around the seeds, which I've tried to draw here. Cool. And when it comes to our beet, um, you tend to find that it, it generally flowers around July, September, but it can flower a little bit earlier. Just like our wild celery is a relative of celery, funnily enough, beet is a relative of beet. Um, <laughs> uh, we've domesticated beta vulgaris into things like um, our sugar beet. So yeah, uh, really nice little coastal coastal plant. Um, our next one um, is scurvy grass, um, which there are a few different and quite similar looking scurvy grass or cochlearia species. Um, but generally, they have features that are consistent with all species um, of, of cochlearia that you'll find on the coast. So um, your scurvy grasses, um, they're, they're, they're a group of typically biennial, so they'll complete their life cycle in two years, uh, low growing and glabrous or hairless plants with um, white four petaled flowers, which your cabbages um, tend, tend to have really, four petals. Uh, when it comes to the leaves, they're really fleshy and rounded, while your basil leaves are usually on long leaf stalks. Uh, when it comes to after flowering, um, what you'll find is that your capsules, which contain the seeds, they're rounded and stout, like little circles, and you'll see a line going around the sort of middle of the capsule. Um, and, and yeah, the capsule will sort of dehiss, it'll break into a couple of pieces to release the seeds. Brilliant. Um, your scurvy grasses generally, depending on the species, have quite a long uh, flowering period, although it's generally around sort of May, June, when most of them flower. Uh, again, really beautiful little wild plant that you'll find in salt marshes. Magic. Now onto something that's a little bit more inconspicuous uh, is our sea cooch, Elymas. Thericus. Now, I, I'm not going to lie, I absolutely hate uh, grasses because they can just be a real trouble to identify sometimes, um, which I'm sure everyone will uh, agree. <laughs> um, agree with that. Um, but the good thing about salt marshes is the diversity of not just grasses, sedges, rushes, but all plants really. One thing that's quite handy when you're trying to identify plants, including grasses on salt marshes, is that salt marshes are generally a really species poor habitat. So you don't get many of them. Uh, this is just one of perhaps three or four different grasses that you might commonly find on salt marshes, sea cooch. Um, and it is probably one of the most distinctive? I think so, I think so. Um, yeah, when it comes to our sea cooch, it's really a plant of sort of upper salt marsh. Um, and what you'll find about the general look of it is it's a tall, a very glaucous grass. So it's got that same blue, gray, green color as sea purslane. Um, it's also patch forming. It's rhizomatous, so it has an undergrowth, underground sort of creeping rootstock. And when it comes to um, other grasses, aside from being glaucous and patch forming, um, when it comes to the flowering spike, those collections of flowers, the spikelets, these little knobbly bits, they're directly attached to the flowering stem. And in most of the grasses on salt marsh, uh, 
Um, what you'll often find is the spikelets aren't directly attached to the stem. Those collections of flowers are in panicles, which means basically that there are lots of little branches before it gets to the, the collection of flowers. Whereas in racemes, we've got a raceme here, our spikelets are directly attached to our flowering stem. Um, brilliant. Now, sea cooch, it's a close relative of common cooch, which you can sometimes quite, quite often find in upper salt marsh, but unlike common cooch, which is generally quite a vibrant uh, green, although it can be a little bit glaucous, sea cooch generally has inrolled leaves and something else which is really quite diagnostic. Um, on the lower leaf sheath, so where the leaf meets the stem and clasps around the stem, that's your leaf sheath, the bit that clasps around the stem. On the edge of the leaf sheath, try to draw it just here, um, you will have in sea cooch a fringe of hairs um, on, on your lower sheaths. So if mid mid. So if you look low low down on the stem, on your leaf sheath, you'll have that fringe of hairs. Brilliant. Okay, sea cooch, the first grass that we've covered. I think we've got one more grass uh, during this during this presentation. Uh, but hopefully people remember that. Uh, brilliant. On something a little bit more, um, a little bit prettier, a bit more obvious um, is our sea milkwort. It is quite a distinctive species that you'll often find in sort of mid to mid to upper salt marsh. And this plant, believe it or not, it's quite a close relative of things like primroses and cowslips. Uh, it's a small rhizomatous perennial plant. So it has that creeping underground rootstock that enables it to form patches. Um, this plant, just like a lot of plants that you get on salt marshes, it's succulent, has succulent leaves, um, which are glabrous, the hairless. Um, the leaves themselves um, are in opposite pairs in four rows. What does that mean? Well, um, if we take a look at this picture, you'll see that the leaves, they come in pairs on opposite sides of the stem. However, um, those pairs of leaves alternate in their position. So you'll get one opposite pair and then another, and then another, and then another. And so if you look at a plant of sea milkwort from above, it'll look like a little cross shape. The leaves are in four rows around the stem. Brilliant. When it comes to the flowers as well, um, they're quite, quite distinctive. Um, so they have these five pale pink, beautiful, uh, beautiful pale pink petals. Um, and the flowers themselves don't have like a flower stalk. So we can describe them as sessile because they don't have a flower stalk. Sea milk, quite a distinctive plant. And oddly enough, a close relative of primroses. Magical. Um, our next species, another MPMS wildflower species is another, I think, another really, really distinctive plant. It's marsh pennywort and it has leaves like little pennies. Um, yeah, it's about the only thing you'll find in damp um, places that looks anything like this. Um, so our marsh pennywort is a small creeping perennial plant, so it forms patches now with glabrous rounded leaves that are about the size of a penny or maybe, oh God, maximum size of perhaps a two pence piece. Um, and the leaves themselves, unlike our sea milkwort, are not in opposite pairs. They are arranged alternately on the stems, on those trailing stems. Not only are the leaves alternate, they're not opposite, but they have 
uh, little flappy bits uh, at the very base of the leaf called stipules. Uh, a lot of plants have stipules and a lot don't. Whether a plant has stipules or not um, can often be quite a good indication of perhaps what species or what family that, might, that plant might be in. So yeah, just thought I'd bring that up. Um, so yeah, marsh pennywort, it has alternate leaves which are stipulate. And those stipules, they're basically just little flaps of tissue. Look, look a little bit like this um, at the very base of the leaf. Um, it's a really, really distinctive plant that you'll often get in very sort of upper salt marsh. Often, um, where there's perhaps a transition to another habitat like sand dune. Um, as well as coastal habitats, you do also find marsh pennywort in um, sort of fens and on the edges of bogs and in other, other nice habitats. Uh, when it comes to the flowers, they're certainly not as conspicuous as these big penny-like leaves. Um, they're really, really small, about one millimeter across um, and white. And they're produced in small clusters of sort of between two and five. And so when it comes to the distinctive features, really, it's all about those penny-shaped leaves. Uh, it can look a little bit similar to a related plant called floating pennywort, which is an invasive species that you'll often find in canals. Um, however, floating pennywort, as the name suggests, generally it's a plant that floats on water. Uh, and the leaves don't really look very round like little pennies at all. They're quite deeply lobed. Um, so yeah, there's there's a little bit about another um, species on marsh pennywort. Magical. Uh, now on to another graminoid, uh, a rush. Um, this time it's our salt marsh rush. Uh, and this is a plant that you will get quite often in sort of mid to upper salt marsh. It is salt marsh rush, Juncus gerardii. And just like a lot of plants, it's rhizomatous. So it's able, it has a creeping underground rootstock that it's able to form patches with. Um, this is really, in fact, might be the only, no, it's probably one of one or two um, rushes on salt marshes that doesn't have um, really rounded um, leaves. When it comes to the leaves, they're channeled. So they've got two distinct faces. If you took a cross section through a leaf, it would look just like this. So when it comes to our salt marsh rush, um, it is quite a distinctive rush on salt marshes. Um, there are maybe a couple of other rushes that have that. Um, like toad rush and frog rush, but they're really small and they look very, very different um, to our salt marsh rush, which is quite a quite a big plant in, by comparison. Uh, so as well as having our channeled leaves um, and as well as it being a, a rhizomatous perennial, when it's in fruit, as this plant is in the picky, um, the fruits, the capsules, are like quite a dark browny colour. And the little scales at the base of the fruit, of the capsule, they're called tepals, the little flappy bits that cling onto the capsule, they're really, really dark, almost black. Um, and uh, another thing about salt marsh rush, um, as well as it being quite distinctive amongst the rushes you get on salt marshes and having those really dark teeples is when it's, um, when you look at the, the, the flowering spike, the lowest bract is shorter generally than the flowering spike. Excuse me, what is the bract? So if you look, excuse me, at a flowering plant of salt marsh rush, you will get a continuation of the flowering stem and it goes to like a point. 
Uh, and this bit that I've circled here, that continuation of the flowering stem from where the, the, um, the inflorescence, the collection of flowers begins, that is the bract. And so if you look at this, this drawing, just over here, this little illustration, you can see this bract is shorter than the flowering spike itself. That's another feature about our salt marsh rush, which makes it characteristic, um, which distinguishes it from other similar species. Magical. Oh my gosh, what time are we on? Right, I'm going to whiz through <laughs> the ones we've got left. I'll try not to waffle. Magic. Another really, really distinctive species on salt marshes are our sea lavenders, uh, limonium species. Uh, it's a group of tufted perennials that you'll find on sort of mid to upper salt marsh. And the leaves look a little bit similar to our sea aster. Um, however, they tend to be a bit bigger and perhaps a bit less shiny. They have a sort of matte appearance to them quite a lot of the time. Unlike our sea aster, where the leaves are quite shiny. Uh, when it's in flower, um, the flowering stems are really heavily branched and terminate in these beautiful um, purple flowers. So sea lavender is quite a distinctive group of plants that we'll find in mid to upper salt marsh. Okay, another one. I'm going to whiz through what we've got left and take some questions so we don't go over time. <laughs> um, Another, another species that we'll find on salt marsh is our sea plantain, Plantago maritima. Beautiful plant, a tufted uh, and glabrous perennial with, just like our sea th our thrift, has linear leaves. However, unlike our sea thrift, these are really quite big and upright and they don't, they don't really form cushions. Um, when it comes to our flowering spikes, all of our flowers arranged, are arranged in really compact spikes. Uh, and when they're in flower, when they produce their anthers, what you'll find is they produce a lot of pollen. If you rub past them, you'll see a cloud of pollen. Um, and our sea plantain, unlike a lot of plants on salt marsh, minus your grasses, sedges and rushes, Unlike a lot of our other flowering plants, it's wind pollinated, hence why it produces loads and loads of pollen. So that's our sea plantain. Um, our other grass that we will we'll, we'll find very often, uh, this is a grass we'll find very, very often on salt marshes. Um, it's often the dominant, in fact, plant of, of, sort of mid uh, salt marsh. It's our common salt marsh. Grass. And this is a really small stoloniferous or creeping grass, which has really narrow leaves, up to about three millimetres wide. As I said, it's usually the dominant plant, especially of sort of mid salt marsh. Um, and it's characterised from other grasses, like our sea cooch, um, which is really different, um, by its small trailing habit forms mats of itself uh, with these narrow leaves and unlike our sea cooch which has those racemes where the the clusters of flowers the spikelets are directly attached to the flowering stem unlike sea cooch we have a panicle and um, so our clusters of flowers our spikelets are on branches well away from our flowering stem. Uh, so common salt marsh grass um, is another grass that we'll commonly find on salt marshes. I think we're on to the last few species now. Um, so sea campion is another species. It's a small cushion forming perennial uh, with glaucous and lance shaped leaves. So it's got those uh, same grey, bluey, greeny colour as things like sea purslane. And when it's in flower, 
when it comes to that, the, the calyx, or all those sepals that are fused together, um, it's really quite inflated is the calyx, these bits here. And then when it comes to the petals, um, our sea campion produces, uh, it's really distinctive plant around the coast, produces these five white um, petals, really, really distinctive plant that you'll often find in really sort of upper salt marsh, maybe in sea cliffs as well. Um, and another plant that we'll often find in upper salt marsh, as well as uh, around about now, in the middle of sort of motorways um, and dual carriageways that are salted a lot over winter, is, is perennial sour thistle. And this is something that should be in flower now, yeah. Uh, it's a tall, another rhizomatous perennial um, with leaves that are lobed. Um, and when it comes to um, our, our perennial south thistle, um, we've got um, spiny teeth confined um, just to the edges of, of the leaves that are otherwise really shiny, glossy and quite, quite hairless. When it's in flower and it has these flowering stems as it should be now, what you'll notice close up if you get a hand lens is the stems of, of our perennial south thistle are covered in these glandular yellow hairs. They're hairs that are tipped with a little bauble-like structure. Um, and yeah, that is our perennial south thistle, should be in flower around now. Um, if you go in a car and drive down any road that's salted, um, you should see quite a bit of it around now. Um, another grass today um, that you'll often find as a pioneer. Um, so early successional salt marsh, um, sometimes in sort of mid, mid marsh as well. It's our common cord grass. This is a tall, another rhizomatous grass that isn't small and sprawling like our common salt marsh grass, um, but it is, it is quite big and tall and upright. Um, and if that wasn't enough, um, common cord grass is quite distinctive in that it has something that only a couple of other grasses in Britain have, around five other, um, it's one of about five, um, species in Britain that have this. Um, if you look at the very base of a leaf of common cord grass, the ligule um, at the very base of the leaf is basically just a ring of hairs. And there's only about five or so species in Britain um, that have that. Uh, when it's in flower, it produces this really tall, pointy and rigid um flowering head magical last last few species i'm gonna hurry it up i'm so sorry um brilliant so lesser sea spurry uh, <clears throat> um is another 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 um species that you commonly find on salt marshes um it's a small sprawling and glabrous uh, annual generally an annual plant, um, with yellowish green, sort of fleshy leaves, which, which you can see pictured here. These pink flowers, when it is in flower, um, are characterized by, by five pink petals and five sepals. However, unlike the next species, greater sea spurry, um, the petals, are generally much shorter than the sepals, which you can just about make out in this picture here. By comparison, greater sea spurry, as well as being a generally bigger thing compared to lesser sea spurry, when it's in flower, the petals are generally bigger than these sepals. Um, and, and Another feature when it's in flower as well is greater sea spurry will always have 10 
stamens, whereas lesser generally has somewhere between two and seven. Um, so there's our greater and our lesser sea spurry. Two more species to go, then done. Cool, take some questions. Um, so another really characteristic species of salt marsh is this beastie, uh, it's annual sea blight, Suede maritima. Uh, and this is a small, uh, either upright or creeping plant of middle salt marsh. And it's quite an interesting little thing. It goes through a colour change as the year goes on. Um, plants generally begin as quite glaucous things. So they have that same colour, that blue, grey, green as sea purslane. Uh, but as the year progresses, um, plants begin to turn purple. Um, they have these fleshy, linear leaves. And just like our sea milkwort, although it looks quite dissimilar, but just like it when it comes to where the flowers are, they're produced in these leaf axils and they're sessile. They don't have a flowering stalk. Um, cool, 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 cool. Um, last species, I'm whizzing through, whizzing through. Um, last species is a really beautiful little beastie called sea arrow grass, um, which does look a little bit similar to our sea plantain. It has those same linear leaves um, that is, it's a tufted plant. Um, however, it is larger than sea plantain. And there is one thing that makes it really obviously different. And that is taking a closer look at the flowering spike. Unlike in sea plantain, when all, where all of those flowers are arranged in a compact spike, each flower is, is pretty much directly attached to the flowering spike, they're sessile. Unlike sea plantain, sea arrow grass have short stalks on the flowers. Um, so the, the flowers and the fruits, they're not sessile, they have a flowering stalk. And if we take a look at a flowering spike of sea arrow grass, you'll see that perhaps those flowers aren't arranged as tightly, as densely as sea plantain. So yeah, sea plantain can look a little bit similar. But when it comes to the flowering spikes um, of that and sea arrow grass, they're really both very, very different. I am so sorry. I think um, my waffling hasn't left much time. <laughs> um, but before I take questions, I do just want to say thank you um, to everyone who let me use a few pictures, especially Nick, Axon, Axon, um, Flora of Ireland on Twitter, Moira O'Donnell, Martin Hammond, Mike Hetherington, and Dave Steele. Um, now, I apologise once again for my big load of waffle. Um, yeah, if we... Not at we... all. Do not, uh, do not apologise at all. That's absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Joshua. And as ever, your enthusiasm really does show and it does rub off. So I hope everybody's feeling as inspired as I do. Oh, do you know, somebody said exactly the same. Stop apologising. It was amazing. Ooh. So there oh, we are. Um, we can, if everybody's happy to just stick around or whoever is happy to stick around for the next sort of five minutes, we can whiz through a couple of questions that we've had. We'll just do um, a few. But of course, if you do need to go, that's, of course, absolutely fine. Fine. Um, you'll be able to catch the answer to these questions when I pop the video up um, on the YouTube channel soon. Okay, so are you ready, Josh? We've got a couple of oh questions God. for you here. Yeah. <laughs> Keep the spotlight on. So we've got one interesting question here. Somebody's asked, can you create new salt marshes by creating artificial leveling off um, of the land at the side of estuaries and potentially even planting appropriately? I suppose in theory you could. Um, but most times out of, the out of 10, if you want to recreate salt marsh, um, it's easier just to reclaim what would have once been salt marsh. So um, a lot of salt marsh has historically been converted to agricultural land and sealed off from the sea with, with various sea defences. Um, a lot of the time, it's simple enough just to realign that sea wall 
and flood the land that was converted from salt marsh. So it reverts back to salt marsh. Might be easier than trying to create something new and a lot less experimental. Um, Makes yeah. a lot of sense, especially yeah. with so many of those, you know, um, under threat, it's better to try and protect those. So I've got another one actually here. What methods of seed distribution uh, does salt marsh pioneer plants use? And actually are they able to spread upstream into rivers, say? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, loads of species have different adaptations to be dispersed by the sea, not just in salt marshes, but a lot of plants that you find on strand lines at the front of sand dunes and on shingle beaches have it too. Um, so a lot of plants will have um, quite big, heavy, bulky seeds um, that, are, that are perhaps filled with air, like... Um, or, or, for example, we, we have curl dock uh, and our coastal subspecies of curl dock have these big baubly things called tubercles on their fruit. And those little those big baubly things on our coastal subspecies of curl dock are much bigger than the little baubly things of our inland curl dock. And the reason for that is because those tubercles act like flotation devices that are dispersed by the sea. Um, a lot of plants on salt marshes have these crazy adaptations, whether it's reinforcing their seeds so they don't die from all the saline inundation, um, or they could fill capsules with air so they could float on the sea. Um, yeah, yeah. Generally, plants by the coast have heavier seeds, um, and they rely a lot less on things like wind uh, dispersal. Just because if you think about it, if your wind dispersed and all your seeds just go off into, into the Atlantic, then you're a bit snookered. Um, <laughs> whereas if you make your seeds a bit heavier, then you're less likely to go extinct. Um, but yeah, yeah, there are those different adaptations yeah. for dispersal. So clever, huh? Okay, a few, a couple of quick more uh, questions uh, we had quite early on, actually. And um, so this is an interesting one. How damaging is the harvesting of samphire, particularly when it pulls out the whole plant? So somebody here is talking about an example that they see quite local to them, where um, businesses are pulling up samphire and are selling them, sometimes with the roots attached. Mm. Does it have a big impact from the start of the, of the salt marsh forming? Well, I think it depends on the species. A lot of people don't know, but we've got loads and loads of different species um, of glasswort or samphire in Britain. Um, some like I don't know, common glasswort or purple glasswort, they're really quite common and widespread in salt marsh situations. But some um, are really very, very rare. Um, and or localized things like perennial glasswort uh, or yellow glasswort nationally scarce um and so i suppose it depends on the species really if you're harvesting something quite common and doing it responsibly i suppose there's not much harm in it but maybe if you're pulling up loads of a really rare species um it might not be so good yeah yeah um so somebody, thank you very much, Martin, has, has provided us with a link to a really great general book on salt marshes in Britain. So do take a look at that for any further information there. And somebody's asked, is there actually a map of salt marshes in the UK that you would recommend, Josh? Yeah. So if you go on to Magic, it's called Magic Maps by DEFRA. Um, you can turn on lots of layers on a sort of aerial map of Britain and Ireland. Um, and if you're, I think it's only if you're in England. Yeah, I think it's only in England. Um, the priority, there is a priority habitat map for coastal salt marsh. So if you can find that little tick box, um, you can basically see all of the salt marsh that's perhaps mapped in, in your area. So that might be something to use. Magic, magic maps, yeah, maybe. I'm only going to be able to say a couple of extra questions, I'm afraid, because I'm really conscious of the time. Um, mm -hmm. But before I do, this is what I absolutely love about um, these webinars. We've actually had a response from somebody um, regarding the samphire, and it, apparently it should not be cut. Um, it should be cut, sorry, not pulled up. And if it is done on a large commercial scale, it actually requires a license. And Natural England is the place to go and ask about that. So yeah. this is what I love. 
these webinars. We have so oh, many. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, yes, brilliant. Most salt marshes are in sort of designated sites, so picking things from them is probably a criminal offence unless you've got special permission. <laughs> so, yeah. Two more quick questions for you, Josh. Um, which species are invasive in salt marshes other than S. Tanzendia? Well, um, common cord grass um, used to be a, a real problem in Britain. Uh, and in fact, people overhype how horrible and invasive it is now. Um, however, something happened a few decades back called Spartina dieback, where all of a sudden, from becoming this incredibly invasive, destructive force that took away wading birds, feeding habitats, and all kinds of other things, um, it's begun to die back. Um, and actually, one of the species I mentioned early on in this presentation, some people think it might be related to that. Um, and that species was Spartina ergot fungus. Um, and what the ergot does is it infects plants um, and replaces what would become seeds with fruit bodies. Um, I don't know whether the fungus does something else. It makes it a bit more diminutive um, or a bit less competitive, I don't know. Um, but Spartina is, is not too invasive now in Britain. Um, Spartina anglica, common core grass. Um, I can't think of many other things that can be invasive in salt marsh apart from one new species, one relatively new species from South Africa uh, called buttonweed. Uh, it's quite pretty, um, but it, it, it can be um, quite invasive uh, in some salt marsh situations. Something to watch out for anyway. Um, anyway. Well, Brilliant. Thank you so much, Josh. I'm, I'm really sorry if we didn't manage to get to your questions, but that doesn't mean we won't answer them. So by all means, if we've not, if we've missed or we've not quite got to your questions, do feel free to email them to uh, support at mpms.org.uk. And perhaps, Josh, if you'd be happy, I might pose them to you or someone will be able to answer for you um, as well. So do please uh, email us with any questions that we've not quite had chance to answer but we're super aware of the time but also just thank you so much for your lovely comments josh everybody's agreeing with me it wasn't waffle at all it was hugely yeah. informative lots of people inspired to go out and, and and take a good look um on their local salt marshes so that's absolutely fantastic thank you for being involved in the conversation everybody as well hey magic thank you thank very much cool well, thank you everybody all right bye, -bye, all right, bye now See you later. Bye. See you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.